Hello and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Bryant and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide for a smooth recording. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is actually on January 6th, and that will also be with Catherine Grant, and that the uh, title of the presentation is still to, to be announced, but be sure to join us on January 6th for that webinar. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Catherine Grant, who will be giving a presentation on English church records, understanding the basics. After years on the sidelines, Catherine began doing family history work and discovered that she loved it. Her specialty is helping new family historians find success and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library. She also presents at Riverton, Utah Saturday seminars and other family, family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. In addition, she is a regular contributor to the Family Search blog. Catherine works as a technical writer and instructional designer with a focus on usability and process improvement. Besides family history, she loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and Christmas lights. And if Catherine is ready, we'll turn the time over to her. Great, Bryant, thank you so much. Well, everybody, welcome to today's webinar. I wanted to give a little preface to this webinar. When I first started doing fam family history some 15 or so years ago, I was totally clueless, like I think all of us are when we start doing family history, right? We all have to start at the beginning. And I just remember how challenging it was to get the information that I needed, especially about English church records, because I have a lot of English ancestry. So in a way, my motivation for doing this webinar was to... <laughs> save other people the distress of not knowing where to find answers, especially about just some of the most basic things that I, you know, it, that it maybe took me years to learn. So I hope that this will be helpful to you. And let's go ahead and dive in. So what we're going to cover today in this webinar, first of all, I wanted to be really clear about the scope of the webinar so that you know what to expect and how it might be able to help you. Then as a kind of overview, we're going to touch on some key dates related to English church records. Then after that, we're actually going to review the records and what to expect, particularly focusing on Church of England parish registers and then also nonconformist registers. Then we'll give, this is the best part actually in my, in my thinking, is research examples because then we'll actually see how this information can be used in real life situations. So we'll look at three very short but probably typical uh, research examples of ways that church records can help you. And then finally, we'll talk about where you can find these wonderful records. So the scope of today's class in scope are Church of England parish registers, which include baptisms, bands of marriage, marriages, and also burials. And then we'll be touching on bishops' transcripts and nonconformist, as we mentioned. But these things are we are not going to cover today. We're not going to talk about other types of church records, such as poor law, settlement and removal, vestry records, things like that. So we will be focusing basically on the church records that relate to uh, ordinances associated with a vital event. Okay, here is our little overview with the key dates. And you know what, I got to move this zoom thing out of the way. <laughs> it's, it's blocking my, my 
my uh, slide. There we go. So in 1534, Henry VIII famously wanted to divorce his wife. And the Pope of the Catholic Church said no. And Henry said, well, fine, I'll start my own church. So he did. He started the Church of England. About four years after that, he mandated that Church of England parish registers be kept, and the entries in those parish registers were to include baptisms, marriages, and burials. In 1598, so about 60 years later, they began to require parishes to send a copy of their registers to the archdeacon or to the bishop, and those became known as bishop's transcripts or transcripts or BTs. And that was kind of a, a, a precaution against lost records because you just never knew if those records were going to, you know, get rained on or eaten by rats or uh, burned in a fire or anything like that. And so they very wisely uh, made the mandate that there should be at least two copies of these records. And the way that's benefiting us today is that sometimes those original records were destroyed and the only thing we have is the bishop tra bishop's transcripts. In 1754, Lord Hardwick's Act of 53 actually went into effect. It was um, proposed and developed in 53, didn't go into effect until 54. And it this act mandated many things. The key purpose was to prevent what they called clandestine or um, kind of off on the side marriages, you know, marriages that weren't really done in the formal church setting. So that was kind of the main purpose. But a part of this act was to mandate printed forms for marriages and bans, which, as you can imagine, makes it a lot easier for us as family historians to read those old records. Then in 1813, the mandate was given that separate registers were to be kept for baptisms, marriages, and burials. Up to that time, and we'll see some examples of this actually, the clergyman could record maybe one baptism and then a couple of marriages and then a burial or two and another baptism, just all in order as he performed those, those rites and ceremonies. They were all on the same page. They were all mixed together. And then in 1813, the mandate was, okay, you got to keep separate books for each type or separate registers for each type of ceremony. And printed forms were to be used for all. And so again, that makes it a lot easier for us as family historians that after 1813, pretty much all parish registers are going to use printed forms. And then in 1837, civil registration begins. The reason, oh, and in case civil registration may not be familiar to some of our, our viewers today, civil registration is just the reporting of a vital event to the government. So in England in 1837, the government required that births, marriages, and deaths be reported to them. The reason that's significant is before 1837, actually mid-year, it started in July, before 1837, really the most reliable records, genealogical records, are church records. After July of eight, or starting in July of 1837, we've got church records and government records. So then those records can kind of support and reinforce each other, or if one is missing, hopefully you can get the other one. So that's that's significant that civil registration started. Then all through this time, as you can imagine, there were people who did not agree with Henry VIII's uh, uh, starting of his own church. And so they belonged to different churches, such as Baptist, Methodist, etc. They were generally known by the term nonconformist because they didn't, quote, conform to the established or state church of the Church of England. And these denominations kept separate records. So let's take a look at these records. Let's look at some examples and what you can expect from them. I wanted to give a couple of caveats up front. These records are representative. Your mileage may vary. There are always going to be exceptions, but hopefully they'll give you a good idea of what to expect and what to expect in which time periods, because as we've seen from the timeline, the style of keeping records changed as printed forms were introduced, as requirements changed, and so forth. <laughs> 
So this is a baptism before 1813 when printed forms were not typically used. So as you can imagine, since these registers were kind of free form, it very much depended on what the clergyman wrote down. It usually, baptisms before printed forms, usually include the name of the child and the baptism date, as you would imagine, and also at least the father's name. They may include the mother's name, but I've seen it where they don't. But these are kind of the typical things to expect before the use of printed forms. Oh, and I did want to point out, just because these are a little bit difficult to read, for most of these uh, examples, I put a transcription down at the bottom so you can see what was actually written. Okay, here's a baptism from 1813 on using the printed form. You can see how much easier that is to read, at least as far as what the information should be. Handwriting, that's another matter, but at least you kind of have an idea of what's supposed to be in that space. So let's walk through the columns in this form. As you'd expect, in the first column, you've got the baptism date. Then you've got the first names of the child, first or middle, um, first and middle, if they had middle names. Then you've got the parents' names. And then you've got the abode, which is really the residence of the family. Then you've got the occupation of the father. Then you've got the name of the clergyman who performed the ceremony. But there's more. I am going to give this clergyman a big hug when I get over to the other side because bless his heart, even though he didn't have to, he recorded the birth date of the children for whom he performed christenings or baptisms. But typically, that ex extra information that's written in by hand that doesn't have its own column is not indexed. So you always want to check the image if you can, because you never know what kind of treasure you're going to find on it. I wanted to point out a couple of other things that you might see on baptism or christening records. You might have seen, seen this notation of PB and wondered what that was, or it may just simply say private. A private baptism was performed if it was thought that the child was unlikely to survive. The beliefs of the Church of England at that time were that if a child died without baptism, their salvation was um, basically in jeopardy that they um, I don't want to get too deep into the doctrine, but it was just that it, it was not a good thing. And so parents were highly motivated for the salvation of their child to have the child baptism baptized before the child died. So you'll see those notations out in this in the margin from time to time. One of the reasons that that's significant to us as family historians is that if you see that PB or that private, you're very likely to see a death record or a burial record not too far after the date of that baptism. Not always. In fact, this particular child, as I recall, he survived. I'd have to, uh, I, I maybe shouldn't have said that. I, I should have double checked that. But to the best of my memory, he actually did not pass away. But most of the time, if that child was very sickly, you know, it just didn't look like they were going to survive. Unfortunately, a lot of times they didn't. So here is another notation that you might see on a baptism, and that is a notation of the child's age at baptism. Usually for Church of England, we assume that the child was baptized pretty close to when they were born, within a few weeks or months or maybe a year or two, but there were exceptions. There were teenage and adult baptisms, and here's one. In fact, this is one of my um, favorite examples. This is for Lavinia Schofield. I searched for her based on her christening date, and I searched and searched and searched and found nothing. And I just thought, wow, you know, maybe it's a misspelling or who knows what the problem is. It wasn't until I got into the register and looked at the image that I saw that she'd been baptized as a teenager. When I went back and searched for other records for her using her correct birth date, surprise, <laughs> I found a bunch of them. So always check the image if you can because you never know what kind of beneficial information you might find. Okay, that uh, wraps up the section on baptisms and christenings, which in the Church of England are essentially the same thing. 
let's talk about bands of marriage. Because those are unfamiliar to a lot of us, I wanted to just run through a, qu a quick crash course on what bands are and why they're used. So bands are the proclamation of the intention of two people to marry. Bands were instituted to prevent invalid marriages. For instance, suppose that a guy had a wife already in another parish. Well, if somebody knew of that when the bands were called, that person could object and say, no, this marriage is not valid because the man is already married. And there were other reasons that uh, marriages could be invalid. Bands were read at church in the home parish of the bride and the groom, if they were different, on three successive Sundays. Bands could be avoided by paying for a special marriage license, but if the couple could not afford it or if they were fine with waiting, they would just have the clergyman call the bands in the church or read the bands. There are a couple of myths about bands going on, which I wanted to address. One is that if bands were read, then the couple definitely got married. And that actually isn't true almost by definition, right? Because the reason bands were called was to give people a chance to object, and sometimes people did. Another myth is that the third band's date is the marriage date, but that is not true. In fact, I am trying to remember if I've ever seen a marriage take place on the third band's date, and I don't think I have. Almost like every time I've seen it, it's been maybe two or three days later or a week later or something. Usually it's not very long, but I don't recall, and, and that's not to say it's not possible. Yeah, of course it could be possible for, for someone to plan their wedding to take place right after the calling of the third bands. But I've actually never seen that. So most of the time you're gonna find that marriage of, of, from anywhere from a few days to maybe a week or so later. So those are myths, and I all, I think that that second myth might have come about because sometimes family search indexers were told to put the third band's date as a marriage date. So if possible, check the image to make sure whether the marriage actually took place. Here's an example. So in Family Search, there was a couple that appeared to be married. This couple was Joseph Henry Tavender and Annie Louisa Baker, and I think that was process, if I'm reading that right. Bands were called for this couple on September 29th, October 6th, and October 13th. From this, it looks like everything's fine, right? But here's the rest of this entry across the page. So this was the left-hand side of the page. This is the right-hand side of the page. Oops, look what happened. Either somebody got cold feet or somebody raised an objection, but this couple actually did not get married. And because of the, um, the way the record was indexed, they were put into family search as a married couple. And the way we discovered it actually is I was working with a friend and we tried and tried to find evidence of this family being married and we could find nothing. And finally we looked at the image and there it was. That's why we found no evidence. In fact, we found this Joseph Henry with a completely different spouse. And at first we thought, well, did she die? Did they get divorced? Um, you know, what happened? And then we discovered that the marriage had never taken place. So moral of the story, always check the image if you can. Here's an example of a band's, a very simple one. And this just lists the, the name of the potential bride and groom, the parish where they're, they're both, um, they're both of that parish, the parish where they're living, and then the three dates on which the bands were called. Interestingly, this uh, record of bands does not include any information as to whether the marriage took place or not. And so this is an example of a type of bands that you'll come across. The marriage may have taken place, maybe it didn't. If it took place, it would have been recorded elsewhere. I have seen bands where the clergyman would actually um, make a kind of a handwritten note someplace in some blank space saying whether or not the marriage took place. But this example had nothing. So you would want to be sure that you confirmed with an actual marriage record that the marriage did take place. <laughs> 
Now here's another type of bands, which is kind of a combined bands and marriage that's actually worked into the printed form. So we have the bands of marriage up here. They were published, which the same thing is called or read. They use various terminology. They were published between Francis Bescaby and Winifred Rodding, both of the parish, parish where the bands were called on June 11th, June 18th, and June 25th. But this form also lets the clergyman record whether or not the marriage was solemnized. And in this case, it was. And actually, it was solemnized three days after the last bands were called. So the last bands were called on the 25th, and the marriage took place on the 28th of June. Okay, those are bands. Let's look at some marriages now. Again, we'll, lo we'll look at marriages that were recorded before forms and then after forms. So marriages recorded without forms normally would include, of course, the name of the bride and groom and also the marriage date. Sometimes these um, free text mar marriage entries would include residences of both the bride and groom, the groom's occupation, once in a while the woman's occupation, the bride's, but a lot of times their occupation was not mentioned if they had a traditional occupation. Many times they um, were, their occupation was keeping house, working at home, which is a very full occupation. But back then they generally did not note that on marriage records. And they, uh, the, these handwritten ones could list the father's names and the father's occupations and whether the marriage took place by bans or by license. So in this one, we see that Robert Pearson and Mary Skelton, both of this parish were married by bans on May the 18th. Here's a marriage record that is actually not my favorite format. And this I actually have not seen a lot of records with this format, for which I'm grateful, because it doesn't include all the information of a better format that we're going to look at in just a second. But you will see this with English records. It contains the name of the names of the bride and groom, the marriage date, the residences of the bride and groom, any witnesses, and whether the marriage took place by bans or license. They may include the marital state and the occupation of the bride and groom. So for example, up here, underneath John Pocock's name, the clergyman has written that he was a bachelor. So he was not currently married, or he was. this was his first marriage. He had not been married before. And Hannah is listed as a spinster, which meant the same thing for a woman. I have seen on these forms sometimes where the clergyman would write the occupation also. So it might say that John was a bachelor and that he was a carpenter printer or something like that. that. Let's see, was there anything else I needed to say about that? No, I think that that takes care of it. They, it this is where it says how they were married. In this case, they were married by bands, but if they had been married by license, it would have indicated that here. Okay, here is the marriage form that I really like because it's got such useful information on it. Let's go ahead and walk through the columns. So, well, walk through all the information, actually. So at the top, we've got the marriage location. Then, not surprisingly, we've got the marriage date. We've got the name of the bride and groom. We've got the their ages. Now, sometimes in this age column, you'll just see the word full. All that means is that they were not minors when they got married. And definition, the legal definition of minor varied at different times. So I'd recommend if you if you see something and you're questioning what the age of minority or majority was at that time in England, go to the Family Search Wiki and do a search on um, like, I think age of majority or age of minority would probably bring up the right article on that. And then you could read more details about that. Also, they would list the marital condition. So whether they were single at the time of marriage or widowed or divorced. Also the rank or profession of the bride and groom their residence at the time of the marriage. One thing to watch for this is that it's not always the same as the birthplace. Sometimes people make the assumption that if they were 
residing in a certain place at the time they got married, that that was their birthplace. And certainly, oftentimes that was true, especially in the 1800s and earlier. But sometimes it wasn't. The um, bride or groom might have gone to London to work, for example, or might have uh, been staying with relatives or something like that. So we can't take for we cannot take for granted that the residence that they where they were living at the time of marriage was their birthplace. Then this is the the most helpful. Um, information, well, not the most helpful, but incredibly helpful information is the names of the fathers of the bride and the groom. And that that just comes in handy in so many ways. In addition to having the father's name, the father's occupation is also usually given. Once in a while, you'll see that they write the word deceased there. Sometimes they'll even write the occupation and the word deceased. So that, that column can be very useful, especially if you're trying to figure out how this couple fits into your family. And we'll actually see an example of that later on. Then down at the bottom, you'll see signatures or marks of the bride and groom. You'll see a mark if the person could not read or write. And generally, the mark was an X. And then the clergyman would write something like his mark or her mark. And they would also write the name. And then also witnesses are included. And these can be very helpful because a lot of times they can help you prove whether this is really your family member or it can give you clues to additional family members. And this marriage certificate or um, registration, reg no, it's not a registration, this marriage record, it's a record from the parish register, also includes whether the marriage was done by bans or by license. Okay, now we're ready for a burial. The early handwritten burials, non-form burials, were just very simple. They would include the name of the deceased and the burial date, and sometimes would include the age of the person, the age of the deceased, and some relationships. So in this case, we've got that William, the son of William and Anne Burkett, was buried on September 28th. A lot of times I've noticed in English parish registers, if they list the parents of the deceased, very likely that child died as an infant. Not always, but you, but um, many times it will give you a hint that you might want to look for um, a birth record for that child that is very soon before that burial record. Okay, once the forms were started, the forms included the name of the deceased, the burial date, the, or excuse me, I'm not going in order here, the name of the deceased, the residence, the burial date, and um, the age, and of course the clergyman. Sometimes they would include relationships, but usually they didn't, or they don't in my experience. Okay, so those are examples of the records that you're going to be using most likely in Church of England records. Let's talk about bishops' transcripts. So these were mandated, as we saw from our little date overview, in 1598, which means theoretically from that time on you've got two copies of every parish register. Of course, in practice, that's not always true for various reasons. Either one or the other was destroyed, or they simply weren't kept, or they were kept and never sent in, uh, various reasons. But a, it is useful to know that there's a possibility that you could have bishop's transcripts if you're having difficulty locating the original parish registers. Generally, the bishop's transcripts followed the same format as the original. In other words, if they were free text or not on a form, then the copies were not on a form. Or if they used forms, then the copies were on a form. Ending dates of bishop's transcripts vary, so some clergymen stopped making bishop's transcripts when civil registration started in 1837. Others continued to make, make them uh, well, in, well past that time, but the dates will vary depending on the, the clergyman and the location and so forth. So you always want to check the original, if possible, the original parish registers. But if all you've got is the bishop's transcripts, then that's sure better than nothing. 
but it's important to realize that Bishop's transcripts can contain errors. I'll give you an example. One guy on my Bescoby line, I, as I recall, his name was Thomas. He had a burial date, and I could not for the life of me find anything else about this guy. No parents, no christening, no nothing. Uh, and it just, he was just kind of suddenly died. And as I recall, there wasn't even an age. And so I just, I kind of kept him in my little log of puzzles. And then one day, I can still picture this in my mind, I was in the library, looking on microfilm of all things. So this was actually, uh, probably, I don't know, maybe five or seven years ago. So I was looking on microfilm, and found the originals. And guess what? The clergyman had miscategorized a birth, uh, so a baptism, really, as a burial. So that record that I had thought for all those years was a burial date, it was actually a christening date. And once I realized that, I was able to find out that this Thomas actually did grow up and he married and had a family. It just, it it actually helped me break past a brick wall. So you always want to check the originals if you can. But then if you if you don't have the originals, the BTs are definitely better than nothing. And you always want to corroborate that information with other records where possible. For more information, see English Bishops transcripts in the Family Search Wiki. I wanted to point out that in Ancestry, Bishops transcripts are noted as a register type. And on the original, if they're showing original records, they actually, at least from what I could see, I don't know if this is a hard and fast rule, but in, in this case, the original record, or excuse me, the original reg register was not noted as an original register. So the transcript is noted, but the original just appears and it doesn't have any special notation about it. In family, uh, family Search, I love this, they actually will note that a collection is a, bishop, a set of bishops' transcripts in the title of the collection. So that makes it really easy to tell. Other sites probably have their own ways of handling this. I just wanted to point out what's done on two of the very commonly used sites. Okay, here's a little puzzle for you. Look at these copies, and and you can post this in the chat if you want. I'm not going to open it up, but um, just to share with each other on this on this in this class. Which one do you think is the bishop's transcript, and which one do you think is the original, and why? Okay, if you answered that the top one was the bishop's transcript, you're absolutely right. What I've noticed about transcripts is that often they are a lot neater. Not always, but they can be a lot neater and the handwriting is a lot more uniform. So you'll notice the clergyman is generally in the last column over here. And if you see that the handwriting is the same, even when the clergyman is different, that's also a tip off that you're looking at bishops transcripts and not the original parish registers. So now let's talk about nonconformists. Let's have a little crash course on nonconformist churches. In 1538, as we said, Henry VIII broke from the Catholic Church and established his own church, which he called the Church of England. It's also sometimes called the Anglican Church. Those who belonged to these other churches became known as nonconformist or dissenters. That's a very high level view. Nonconformist denominations included Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Society of Friends, also known as Quakers, and Latter day Saints. Nonconformist, and this is the point that's so helpful for us as family historians, is that nonconformists kept their own church records. So you will likely not find your nonconformist ancestor in Church of England records, 
the exception to that is that there was a time period when all marriages had to be performed in the Church of England, even if the adherents belonged to a nonconformist church. But generally, nonconformists kept their own records, and you're going to find great information about your nonconformist ancestors in those particular records. Once again, I would refer you to the wiki if you'd like more information on nonconformist churches. So the thing I love about nonconformist registers is that they very is that they very often included more information than Church of England registers. So here's an example. You notice that this register, this birth register, includes maiden surnames of mothers. And oftentimes those are the hardest things to find. So the fact that this clergyman wrote those down can be a huge help to us as family historians. Here's another example. This is a burial register. So you notice that this one includes the actual death date, whereas most, most Church of England registers only list the burial date. Then also in the description column, we've got a bunch of family relationships mentioned, whereas most Church of England burial registers don't list relatives. So consider that if you've got nonconformist uh, ancestors, you're fortunate because you could get some really great information from the nonconformist registers. Okay, let's get to the fun part, which is the research examples. In other words, how is all this stuff we've been talking about helpful to you in doing your own research? So here we've got a record of my ancestor, John Bescovy. Actually, he might be a cousin. I might have found him through descendancy. But here he is. And I wanted to find out where he came from, like who were his parents and how old was he and so forth. He didn't give his age. So I don't have any idea just looking from this record. Probably he's between 20 and 50. That's kind of a, a marriageable span. We notice here he's a widower, so he could have been a little bit older, but I do not know an age. So I'm going to look at some of this other information. I notice that his dad is John and that his occupation is a tailor. So to find out where this guy came from and hopefully get a good birth year, I am going to look for a christening of John from about 1793 to 1823. The way that I calculated that was I subtracted 50 and 20 respectively from the marriage date of 1843. So that would put us in this range of 1793 to 1823. And probably it's going to be in Lincoln since that's when they were married. And also at that time in England, a lot of the families didn't move around a lot, especially my ancestors didn't because they were very poor. And so this guy was a, a laborer. This You might think this says lawyer, but it actually doesn't. It says sawyer. So he was uh, what we would call a blue collar worker. Uh, and they in England at this time, for what it's worth, they actually didn't call them lawyers. They called them solicitors or barristers. People who were in the legal profession had those types of titles. So my poor ancestor probably did not move from Lincoln. So I feel like I've got a pretty good chance of finding him in this time period and in this area. So I went to one of my favorite sites, which is freereg.org.uk. This is a site run by volunteers, bless their hearts. They have transcribed over 45 million parish register entries, and these are free for everybody to search on the web. So I love this site, and I found things on this site for my English ancestors that I have not found anyplace else. So I put in the information that I knew about John. Uh, last name Bescoby, first name John. We're searching from 1793 to 1823. He's in the county of Lincolnshire, probably in the parish of Lincoln, and I want baptisms. Well, look at the results I got. Three possibilities, and these were all the results in that whole span. So we've got a 20, 25th of January, a 23rd of October, and a 26th of September. Sorry, those were 1818, and then this one's the following year, 1819. So let's take a look at the additional information for these entries. <laughs> 
So which one do you think is the right one? Yep, if you said the top one, I agree with that. We've got John Bescoby, a tailor, which at that time was kind of an unusual occupation. There were a lot of miners. There were a lot of agricultural laborers, at least in my ancestry. But this guy, so, so for him to be a tailor and for this age to be pretty much what we were expecting and the name to be correct, I feel very confident that this is the christening of my John Bescoby. So now I can move forward with a better idea of his birth year. I can find him with more confidence in the census. I can be more confident when I find a burial record, so on and so forth. Okay, here's example number two, finding all the children. So I found Joe Hudson and his parents, Fred and Jane, in the 1901 census. There was a hint, and you probably recognize that this is an ancestry screen, and there was a hint off to the side for this christening. So I looked at this christening and thought, you know, I, oh, and Joe was the only kid with his parents in the 1901 census. And I thought, I wonder if he's got siblings, because if he does, they're probably in this same set of parish registers. So here is a very cool tip that I don't think is widely known. Whenever you're on Ancestry and you see the name of a record collection under the name of the person, you can click that to bring up a search form that will just search that collection. So how cool is that? So that's exactly what I did. I clicked that record title and got this search form and I entered in the information. So I know that Joe's siblings are going to have the last name of Hudson. I picked a date that was kind of between the 1901 and the 1911, where we would expect to find that family. And then I put in the name of the father, Fred, and the mother, Jane. Well, look what came up. Turns out that it looks like Joe has three brothers, Harry, Frank, and William. But I can't conclude that just by looking at this. So I went into the images and look what we've got. The address for the top two boys, let me back up there, that was for Joe and William, matches the address in the 1901 census. So that's pretty strong evidence that these boys belong to that family. And then in the for the next two boys, which were Frank and Harry, we've got an address and a father's occupation that matched the 1911. So we've got really good proof that all these boys belong in the same family. And all of them were missing from family tree. So they can all be added. Okay, our last real life example is of verifying a marriage. So I was researching Ivy Mae Heading, and I had her with her parents in family tree, and I wanted to know if she got married. So I did a search and found a marriage, but how can we be sure that this Ivy Mae heading is the same as this one in the 1911 census, which I knew was mine? You might think Ivy Mae heading, well, that's a pretty unique name. But what I've discovered is that families would often reuse the same unique names. Like I've got Francis Bescobies that are just used over and over. That's a unique name compared to other families, but it's not at all unique in the Bescoby line. And the same thing could have happened with Ivy May. Maybe she had cousins or um, her, her mother's name or something. You know, they could have reused that name through the family. So I didn't just want to jump to the conclusion that this marriage was really for her. So we, um, I wanted to look at the 1911 census just to get some key information for what we already know and see how well it matches up with that marriage record. So here's Ivy May. She's nine in the 1911. And her dad is George William Heading. And he is a potato salesman. I love that. I don't know if he had roots in Ireland or friends in Ireland or something. Because, you know, you've probably heard about the potato famine. And uh, potatoes were, for a long time, one of the main crops in Ireland. And so he sold potatoes. And I love that, not only because it's a really cool and unique occupation, or a really cool occupation, but because it's pretty unique. So this is hopefully going to enable us to 
match up the dad's occupation on the marriage record. So let's take a look at the marriage record. So here we've got Ivy May as the bride and we've got her dad. And I know this is possibly not easy to read, but it does say George William Heading. And I'll have to admit to you, the first time I saw this, I thought it said collate. I thought it said collate salesman. I'm like, collate? What? And then I looked at it more closely. In fact, it was funny. It was actually in one of the BYU Family History Library Sunday classes that I was looking at it with another participant in the class. And we both looked at it and we're like, oh my gosh, that has to be potato. And the other members of the class also, they were faster than I was and realized that it really did say potato. So we've got really good proof that this marriage record is for the same Ivy May heading who appeared in the census, who was my Ivy May. So now I know that she married this Victor John Waddingham and I can put him in family tree and move forward with um, more, you know, building out this family, their children and so forth. Okay, so last part of the class today is now that we've learned about all these wonderful records, where do we find them? Well, as you might guess, the big four are going to have those parish registers. So Family Search Historical Records will have them, and, and they won't all be identical collections, but each of these sites will have very good collections of parish registers. So Family Search Historical Records, Ancestry, find my, uh, excuse me, Ancestry, Ancestry.com, I can talk, FindMyPast.com, and MyHeritage. They will all have collections of English parish registers, and I believe all of them have non-conformist records too. I know that Find My Past does. Well, uh, okay, I know that these three do. I'm not positive about my heritage having non-conformist because I just don't have the personal experience with that, but I bet they do. I'd actually be very surprised if they didn't. And somebody can correct me on that. If you know for sure that my heritage has non-conformist records, maybe you could post that in the chat. In addition to those large kind of multi-purpose sites, there are also specialty sites that will particularly focus on parish registers. One of those, as we saw, is Free Reg. Another of my favorites is the Online Parish Clerk. So they will have just different Online Parish Clerk sites for different counties. Then there's this really cool site that I just learned about maybe, I don't know, two or three weeks ago. So I'm not as familiar with it, but from looking at it, it looks like it contains very valuable information. So I look forward to learning more about this site. And it's just, uh, gosh, I don't remember if it's parishmouse.com or .org. I'll bet you it's .org, probably .org.uk, but Google Parish Mouse and you'll find the, you'll, you'll find that site. And then Dusty Docs is another one. And this one also, I don't have a lot of personal experience with, but I have friends who have used it. And I, it also comes up in search results. So this is another option for finding parish register records. Then finally, two other resources that we don't want to forget are the Family Search Wiki, which if you search for a place in the Family Search Wiki, so for instance, if I searched for Lincolnshire, England, it would give me a page that had a bunch of wonderful detail on where to find records for Lincolnshire, England, and that includes parish records. So um, the Family Search Wiki is wonderful. And then also, we don't want to forget about microfilm because and there are only a few places where you can see microfilm anymore. And actually, because of COVID, most of us can't actually see the microfilms. But there are still microfilms available in Salt Lake, the Salt Lake Family History Library, the Riverton Family History Library, and the BYU Family History Library. Students can currently go to the BYU Family History Library, as I understand it. Bryant, correct me if I'm wrong on that. That, but I understand that student, students are allowed, so students could currently see these microfilms. So the reason that can be valuable is that not everything has been digitized and indexed. And so for the time being, there may be some records that are only available on microfilm. Eventually, that will no longer be true because the goal of the church is to get all these, these records digitized and indexed.
So that brings us to the end of our class today. We reviewed some key dates for English church records. We talked about what to expect. We reviewed actual examples from the Church of England and nonconformist records. And the um, parish registers from the Church of England included those bishops' transcripts. We walked through three typical research examples and talked about where to find the church records. So that brings us to the end of the webinar today. And Bryant, do we have any questions? Yeah, it looks like we do have a couple questions. Um, one is from Delir and it says, how, how do we edit indexed records and ancestry? For example, names, dates, etc. Oh, that is a great question, because I'll, you will find mistakes from time to time. Let me go back to an image that will answer that. So do you see here on this screenshot of this Joe Hudson christening record, you can click add or update information, and then it will give you a set of fields, like it'll say name, uh, date, residents, different things like that. And each one of those, it will allow you to specify what they call alternate information. And then later on, if that, as I understand it, that information is moderated. So somebody at Ancestry checks it to make sure that it looks reasonable. After it's approved, it will actually show up in brackets underneath the person's name. So great question. That's how you can correct indexes on Ancestry.com. Any other questions? Awesome. Um, one second. Yeah, it looks like we have another question. It says, would you have time to show me again on Ancestry the value of clicking on an on the name of the project shown under the person's name? Oh, yes, absolutely. I, I absolutely love that because it's it just makes things so convenient. So right here for this particular scenario, I had found Joe. I wondered if he had siblings and I knew that if he did, they would most likely be born in the same parish. So by clicking on this record name, I get a search form that only searches within that record set. So that saves me from getting, you know, all these other uh, Hudson kids that are born in other places that probably aren't mine. It's just a way of limiting it to the record collection where it's most likely that you're, that the information you're looking for is going to be found. I hope that helps. If it doesn't, please post a follow-up question and I will do my best to explain it more clearly. And it looks like that's all the questions in the chat box right now. But if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to post them in the chat box. And I see the kind words of thanks in the chat and just wanted to say thank you. And I'm really glad that you found it useful. That was my hope. Great. Well, if that is all the questions, thanks so much once again, Catherine, for presenting. You bet. My privilege. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for attending our last webinar of the year. And we hope you're able to join us next year on January 6, also with Catherine Grant. And that'll be at the same time, Wednesday, 5.30 p.m. So be sure to join us for that. We hope you have a great Christmas and have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.